Yogendra Yadav could be the most accurate political analyst. He is a phenomenal personality today. He is both a he comments on political processes, he analyzes them for us, and he's also a participant in politics because he's an activist, he's been a political worker. And right now, I may sort of say that in my view, he gives you the most incisive insights into what's happening in our country. And in 2024, he turned out to be the phenomenal predictor of the electoral outcome. So I'm very, very happy to talk to my old friend, who I've not met for a decade, I think, but I have phoned you a few times, uh, Mr. Yogindra Yadav. Thank you so much for making time for Frontline Conversations. Thank you, Sabha, for such a generous introduction. No. Honestly, after this introduction, the best thing I can do is to keep quiet, <laughs> because I can only ruin my reputation now. <laughs> no, 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 but I do believe that is the case uh, today. Sure. And it's been, actually, it's, it's been a process in academics and sophology, and now you are here. You're both on this side and on that side. Frankly, I'm just a political worker, political activist. Mm -hmm. And yes, political activists should think as well. And there was time in our country when political activists used to write, used mm -hmm. to think. Uh, that time has, uh, in a sense, gone. And uh, we are much the worse as a country for that. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, unlike the West, where most of the political thinkers and writers have been in the academia. Mm -hmm. In our country, much of political thinking has been done by activists, those who are involved in politics. That distinguishes okay. India from mm -hmm. West. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the decline of that tradition, mm -hmm. uh, I think our country has lost something of political imagination, understanding, judgment, mm -hmm. and shifting of a political thinking mm -hmm. from the world of political leaders to the world of academia. Hmm. Uh, has been a bit of a disaster, I think. Right. You've just <laughs> written a column about this. That's right, we'll, I did. We'll have some of your friends in academia annoyed, I, I imagine. <laughs> it's usual thing. You see, the, uh, what happens uh, very often is uh, when you make an argument, hmm. uh, people look at examples rather than the argument. Hmm. Uh, uh, now, some of the uh, some of the criticism could be fair. Hmm. You know, people look at that and say, why no women? Why not someone from this side or that side, etc. And uh, these could be my limitations or my mistakes. Uh, the real question is, does it affect the argument? Mm. The argument is, which is what I wrote in the Express uh, this week, uh, that our country had a very rich tradition of political thought, primarily out of those who were political activists. Mm. Uh, activist thinker was the mode of political theorizing in India. Mm -hmm. That mode was vibrant in 1930s, 40s, 50s, mm. till 1960. Yes. Then it suddenly declines. Mm. And within 25, 30 years, it's not there at all. It's not there. And this decline is not merely the loss of the world of activists. Mm. It is a decline. It, it's a serious cost for India because our political judgment is shockingly poor today. Mm. Uh, polit the politics is bereft of political vision. Mm. Political understanding is very seriously defective. Mm. Uh, so while we all comment on the loss of morals in politics, which is of course true, yes, which is true. but we don't sufficiently comment on lack of loss of imagination, thoughts, mm. ideas. Mm -hmm. And this is not just ideas of my liking, mm. ideas that I dislike, say mm. even in RSS, which yes. I stoutly argue against and stand against. Mm. If you look at the RSS, there's very serious loss of imagination and vision within the RSS. So look at the right, look at the left. Yes, there's a I'm... very serious decline of political imagination. In uh, that in that article, you what I found very interesting because I'm a student of politics yes. and a journal, and I've studied the BJP and the RSS, is that you mention Ambedkar, Gandhi, and then you mention a lot of socialist thinkers, and you also include Savarkar. Sure. And uh, and I do think that when I look at the right, the Savarkar is the most significant thinker of the right wing. Absolutely. So you mention people who are thinking about. Uh, I include Savarkar. I include Goldwalker. Mm -hmm. I I am opposed to. I completely yes. disagree with their vision. Mm. But if someone were to ask me to design a course on thinkers, yes, I would keep them there. I want students of Indian politics yes, yes. to know I this agree perspective. Entirely, I yeah. want to keep Jinnah there. I want to keep Mododi there. 
Mm. Uh, these are thinkers I disagree with, mm -hmm. uh, but their ideas are very important because we should know that. And these are thinkers. Mm -hmm. I would never say Goldwalker is not a thinker. Mm -hmm. He's a thinker whose ideas I happen to completely disagree mm -hmm. with. Uh, but, you know, so there was a time when, uh, or, you know, what is common to all of them? Mm -hmm. All of them are into politics. Mm -hmm. RSS people are into politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are writing thinking, speaking, mm. not merely about what happened last week yes. and what may happen next month, mm. but about what it might be like 10 years from now, what it was 500 years ago. Yes. There is a larger, so they operate they with offer a bigger a vision. horizon. They offer they a vision, offer a vision yeah. understanding. They come up with new concepts, new categories, mm. new divisions. So much of what was done in Western thought mm. through the academia mm. is being done by practicing political activists in India. It's an involved mode of thinking. Mm. Uh, that, and then all of them are mm. incidentally aware of what's happening in the world, are writing about India, but mm. complete awareness of the world. Mm. All of them are comfortable with the English language, mm -hmm. but almost every one of them has one leg in a language other than English, mm -hmm. which they are relating to. Right. We have today is a decline in every single respect. Mm. Most of our thinkers, theorists, mm. are limited to English language. Mm. Mm. They actually don't read and write any language other than English. Mm. Mm. Now, knowing English is an asset, it's an asset but knowing yes. only English yes. is a serious handicap in a country like yes, India. Yes. Most of them are confined to universities. Mm. Their principal audience mm. Mm. is not the Indian public. Mm. The principal audience is Western academia, mm. Mm. to which they are responding. Mm. Uh, so we lift some of their very insightful things. We lift some of their completely useless concepts, which have no resonance in India. You know, we are answering their questions. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as a result, we also have a serious loss of political vision. Yes. You know, we pick up some trendy Western thinker mm. who changes because their fads change, mm. their fashions change. What does it have to do with me? Yeah. You okay. Know? So what is, is there a vision that you would, I'm asking you, what vision do you think we should have in India? Because you are working in the political field. What is interesting about you, and I'll repeat this, is that you have been the first sophologist who we all knew about, the public knew about. And today, it seems to us that political science is just a group of people who every now and then appear on channels and they predict the next election. It seems to be a very stunted exercise. I'm not, I'm not coming down on anyone, you know, but you moved out of that domain, you know, even though you did do an amazing prediction of the recent elections. So it just seems to us that people just pop up and this mostly go along and they say that, you know, there will be a one, one sided, uh, that's apology. And many of them are friends of mine. So this is not a, but as an exercise, even politics now, uh, it's just one side wants secularism and now apparently social justice. And the other side does not want secularism. It says it wants social justice. There is doubt whether it really does, but we don't know. You know, everything is trapped in binaries. Is there something beyond that you, since you've thought about these things and you are practicing politics on the ground, you are someone who's doing the field work more rigorously than journalists, academics, and researchers do. So is there a vision that you're offering? Uh, two things. Uh, one quick comment about political science. Uh, mm. uh, when I was in political science, I used to be very, very critical. But to be honest, it would be unfair to judge the discipline by the few faces that we happen to see on television. Yes, I know, uh, I'm, I agree. We have a deep, yeah. uh, we have some absolutely brilliant, outstanding minds. I think of uh, Pratap Mehta, I read Suhas Palshikar, I see to read Peter D'Souza, or those who don't write for newspapers that often, Neeraj Jayal, Nivedita Menon. Uh, these are no, I'm not doubting. So I'm a all big kinds fan of, of Mr. Palshikar. So, also. so, uh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, so that, that's one thing. But yes, the larger question, what is the vision? Uh, I call it, I'm trying to develop that uh, further. I call it India's Swadharma. Mm. Now, most of us balk at the idea of Swadharma. The word Dharma means to suggest religions, mm. Hinduism, mm. because you know, we, 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 we know so little about that universe that we've simply turned our back to it. Mm. I call it India's Swadharma, mm. which is to say, uh, or in English, you could say the idea of India. Mm. Now, it sounds abstract. But if you look at it, my argument is this. Mm. that Indian constitution mm. is sacred to my mind mm. because Indian constitution happens to be, a, uh, happens to have inscribed 
the values from our freedom struggle, mm. which were not accidental. Mm. Values of our freedom struggle are values which are drawn from our civilization of the last 3000 years. Mm. Mm. So Indian constitution's preamble mm. in many ways is a condensed version mm. of the civilizational values. Mm. What we, you know, for me, those three critical civilizational values are Karuna, Maitri and Sheed. Okay. All these are three words which you are aware in the tradition. Mm. They're not to, with one religion either. Most mm. of them are actually crystallized in Buddhism. Mm. Mm. Karuna, which we today call, uh, we think of Daya, that's mm. not, it's a deep compassion. What we today call equality and socialism mm. is actually based on Karuna. Mm. Mm. Uh, Maitri, mm. friendship, fraternity, mm. fraternity, something that Dr. Yes. Ambedkar, you know, really mm. brought mm. into mm. discussion is the basis of what we call secularism. Mm. And Sheila is actually virtuous conduct. Mm. Uh, that is un that underlies what we today call democracy. So democracy, socialism, secularism, the three pillars of our mm. constitution, mm. actually draw upon three absolutely central values mm. of our civilization. Mm. That's, that, is the I that is the idea of India. Mm. That is the Swadharma of India. Mm. And for me, uh, taking that, that Swadharma provides the vision. That is the ideology okay. that we need to develop. Uh, the constitution has given it, but uh, it is our responsibility right. to take it forward. What does it say about the world of climate change? Nothing. Mm, we have nothing. to develop it. We have nothing. Yeah. Uh, what do we, uh, how do we face the challenge of contemporary capitalism? Mm -hmm. The word socialism and karuna doesn't tell you very much. Mm. You need to develop it. Mm. So one, you need to develop new policy formulations drawn from these mm. values. Mm. Two, you need to articulate these values for a new generation in a new language. Mm -hmm. Every 25 years, you have to come up with a new language. Mm -hmm. The langu old language just doesn't work with the new generation. Mm -hmm. And we've been completely negligent of that. You know, we got, broadly speaking, you and I are from the same generation. Mm -hmm. I think we are, we are criminally guilty mm. because we took our constitution for granted. Yes. And we thought, theek hai Supreme Court, hai constitution, hai secularism, hai, you know, so, and we each got into our own careers, our family, yeah. our own little individual petty yeah. pursuits. And this responsibility of taking those constitutional values to the new generation mm. is something we completely neglected. Mm. So an ordinary Hindu, educated Hindu, mm. thinks that secularism is an unnecessary concession made for Muslims. Yes. Honestly, that's a yes, feeling. Yes. Uh. What is socialism? These are the common sense. So who's responsible for this? We are responsible yeah. because we never cultivated these values. We mm. never managed to explain to an ordinary Indian that every one of us is a minority in this country, mm -hmm. either in terms of religion, caste, ethnicity, language, mm -hmm. at the state level, national level, or in your mohalla. Mm -hmm. Every single Indian is a minority. Mm -hmm. you, want to, uh, you want to crush minorities? Mm -hmm. Be prepared, that is mm -hmm. your turn sometime. That's mm -hmm. a simple thing you, need to, you could have said. No one said that. Mm -hmm. uh, about social justice, mm -hmm. about uh, reservations. Now, most educated Indians harbor mm. such deep, deep demands, resentment, about, resentment about it, which only reflects our lack of, lack of compassion, uh, lack of compassion. My three yeah. karuna. <laughs> and then, but but we've, never, we've never really cultivated these mm -hmm. things uh, to, to, to give it a Is new it? name for every generation. We, we, we were negligent. Well, I mean, one, one can say that India is unique because of the graded inequalities in our system. Yeah. So we are actually trained not to uh, be compassionate towards people, yeah. but to be apart from them. Yeah. Now, uh, you have inequalities all over the world. Mm. Uh, in in America, for, for example, if I go to US universities, very unjust society, very unequal society, racially divided. Among the educated Americans, mm. there is a sense that I'm privileged. Mm. I draw from privileges that I have done nothing to earn. There is that sense. So there is that sense. Okay. When I go to, uh, you know, so, so, so uh, uh, when you are, when you're walking in the US, mm. you find a society that's so grossly unequal mm. and blatant and somewhat, uh, Mr. Trump is a very good example of what yeah. that society is like. But the moment you enter universities, you find a certain cultivated awareness of privileges and a sense of moderation mm. that, okay, mm. I'm so. So you speak, uh, you speak to them about women, they would say something sensible, mm -hmm. you know, because they're aware of what they have inherited. Yes. 
In India, I find exactly the other way around. You okay. walk on the streets, there is a sense that something should be done for the poor, disadvantaged, yes, and so yes. on. From ordinary people, actually, they do not even ordinary upper caste poor. No, there, is, there can not, be a level of compassion some, among some of them. Yeah. Enter our universities, mm. enter our most elite, privileged places. These are condensed prejudices. Really? Okay. And this, so what? Why reservation? Why this to Kashmiris? What about Muslims? And, and about women, I mean, the kind of thing educated Indians can say about women yes. is cringeworthy. I mean, I honestly mm. feel, did you never go to school? Mm. Have you never learned mm. some basics in your life? Mm -hmm. so that's the problem. So that all these are our failures. Mm. I think you and I, people like us, should own it up and mm. say, we failed to cultivate these values. We took our constitution for granted. We took our freedom struggle for granted. And never late. We should start it now. No, I agree with you, except could it be that the market has just blown away values, all reasonable values, of humanistic values? I mean, since we are... we Market, caste, order, yes. patriarchy, yeah. patriarchy, all of them constantly work towards diluting these values. So they, these are perennial but, influences. Yes. So, but you continue a struggle against them yes, all I, the time. I agree, There's I patriarchy. Yeah. But you talk about... Just making Indian men aware mm -hmm. that that preventing rape is not the responsibility of women. It's in the you know our conversation that, has yeah. taken into organic life, but I had I mean yeah. the point. This is, is about this is about educating men in this society. Right. You know, I mean they should have some sanskar. Yeah. You know, it's not women who need sanskar. Yeah. Men of this country need sanskar. Boys of this country mm. need sanskar. Mm. Uh, why have we not been able to cultivate that? Mm -hmm. And why do educated Indians mm -hmm. speak exactly like their great grandfathers mm -hmm. must have spoken? Mm -hmm. That's True, our failure. Absolutely. It's our collective failure as a nation. Yeah, yeah. So that really, so that is the, this is the swadharma of India. Mm. Now, mind you, uh, because before someone else says it, what we have inherited from our civilization has a lot of complete nonsense, mm -hmm. which has to be put in a dustbin, which mm. is what our freedom struggle did, frankly. Mm. You know, they picked up all the civilizational values. Are you talking about things like Manus Smriti? Manus Smriti, caste system, um, yes. or prejudices against outsiders, mm -hmm. prejudices against women. Mm -hmm. All these we have inherited. Absolutely. And it's the job of every generation, every mm. movement, acts as a filter. Mm -hmm. It says, this is what I accept from my past. Mm. This I junk. Mm. Uh, our freedom struggle was the great filter that we put mm. between our civilizational heritage mm -hmm. and our future prospects. Mm -hmm. So it produced people mm. who were very modern. Mm. Gandhi is a very modern, modern person, person. Mm. very modern and deeply aware and proud of their civilizational heritage. Mm. It produces a desi modernity, mm. which is what we need. What we have today, unfortunately, mm. you know, at the time of independence, mm. we were in 1946, let us say, mm. we were politically enslaved, mm. but we were culturally mm. more aware of our independence. Okay. Today, we are politically free, mm. Culturally, we are much less free than we were 70 years ago. A certain culture of imitation, right. uh, of not being aware of our values, etc., has created a vacuum. Mm. And BJP has walked into that vacuum. It's a vacuum that people like you and me have created, a cultural vacuum of a modern Indian. Khali dabba hai. Us khali dabbe mein ya ke bas tilak tarajud kare sab dal dete hain. I remember when BJP came in, it was in a conversation with you and I heard you or I spoke to you, I don't remember, because we, you were the first person I heard using the phrase, uh, this is hegemony, when people needed to understand what had happened, 2014 happens, yeah. something happens and you came up with that phrase and I said, that's it, that phrase explains, we, were, we, we have lived in a situation of hegemonic control and then suddenly we are out of it. In a sense. Are we out sense, of it? Yeah. In a sense. So I'm glad you remembered that. Because the, the moment you said no, I remember the, that the, phrase. the word hegemony tells you something that it's not merely power. It's mm. not merely dominance. Mm -hmm. And I said post-2014, we had entered a new era, not merely because BJP was electorally dominant. Mm. Electoral yes. dominance is one of those you, things. You gave a whole construct, which was so, very useful. Uh, so we are dealing with the state power, mm. political dominance. Mm. 
and cultural and ideological supreme. Yes, that was it. It is this third thing makes it hegemonic. Third thing makes hegemonic. Because, I mean, that's, it's, 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 that's political science wisdom drawn from mm. Italian Marxist called Antonio Gramsci. Oh, yes. Who said that ruling class rules not mm. merely because it has police. Yeah. Ruling class rules because it rules your minds. Mind, yeah. This is what BJP did. You, you know, you said all this and I remembered yeah. it. Now, what has happened today, mm. I think it's too early for us to say that uh, that hegemony has collapsed. Okay. Uh, BJP still controls state power, mm -hmm. uh, although, well, they are panchar to ho gaye hain. Mm -hmm. to, right. Absolutely. But so, so I said it's a power without, uh, without, uh, uh, without a certain kind of complete acceptance. Uh, mm -hmm. I used uh, expression for that, uh, mm -hmm. Iqbal. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it is state power without Iqbal. Mm -hmm. uh, they have electoral dominance has been uh, has been fractured. Mm -hmm. But do remember, they have spread to Tamil Nadu, they have gone to uh, Urisa, Urisa. Not Tamil, I mean, Urisa. Uh, no, in, even, even in Tamil Nadu, their vote share gain is uh, significant. BJP mm. is a truly national party now. Mm -hmm. So there's this. In terms of ideological and cultural dominance, mm. I think that is still to be cracked. You don't think that's being challenged? Uh, it is beginning to be challenged. And in fact, the only one from the opposition who I see challenging the ideological mm. thing is mm. Rahul Gandhi. He's challenging them on an ideological ground. On social justice? On... Exactly. Tum kaun hote ho hinduon ke, tum hinduon ke theke daar nahi ho. Mm. Someone needed to say this. Mm. Or to say that you're trying to bring back Varnashram system in this country. Mm. You know, so that's an ideological. Mm. Or on the word monopoly capital mm -hmm. was used in the parliament. Mm -hmm. These are ideological challenges. So, mm -hmm. but it's a beginning of just all that. Uh, BJP's ideological dominance should not be underestimated. Because they have, even if you look at opposition leaders mm -hmm. who may be sitting on the opposition side, but if you scratch them, their opinions and so on, uh, BJP's dominance would be seen even there. When I speak to, uh, let's say, an ordinary opposition worker on the ground mm. and I talk to them, let's say, about Muslims, and mm. if that person himself is not Muslim, mm. Within five minutes, the language they speak about Muslims is BJP's language. It okay. is not the Congress language. Mm. It is not the Samajwadi Party language. Mm. It's not the RJD language, mm. although they may belong to any of these parties. Mm -hmm. So this, there is a deep, this is infiltrated very deep. Okay. And it would take a very long time, this detoxification. So, so to my mind, that's the real challenge. So the hegemony is still there in the yeah, mind. Uh, ideological dominance is something which needs to be dealt with. It's still there. It's very deep. It's deep for several reasons. A, the sheer propaganda and the, the, it's not nafrat felai hai. The television channel. It's just, it's entered so deep that it takes time. Two. I've noticed today, yeah. when, when we, rape is in the discourse, because yeah. you've had this atrocious incident in Kolkata and the, the, the there's been a, such a disturbing sequence of events after that by, by the state government and then suddenly you also have the politics around it. It's so disturbing and then you have such concern over an incident involving a person from a certain background mm -hmm. while Dalit women continue to be raped in this time frame and nothing happens. So then and is... then you have an incident in Maharashtra. But so in between all of this, on social media, Mr. Yadav, Prominent journalists, what they have done is they have put out an old case of Ajmer Darga rapes. Now, you wonder about people and we are not, these are, they have said, do you remember that horrific rape? It is said factually. But I was just thinking everything is just trying to show that Muslims did it. Even though this, it's, the depth it's so. To which, the depth to which the media in this country yeah. has sunk one day would be taught as a textbook example all over the world oh. of how media can become source of the problem in a country. Mm. You know, it's like the uh, uh, Tutsi Hutsu mm. dispute uh, where radio played such a critical yes, yes, role. Yes. Uh, radio Rwanda. Radio Rwanda played that kind mm. of a role. Our media has played that role and they must be held to account for this. So somebody is trying to say that, uh, no, no, forget all this Muslims. Do you remember Muslim men of the... So I was just thinking it's got nothing to do with the news today. This you know? morning, one of the national dailies carries a front page banner headline hmm. saying, and this is not a communal national daily, hmm. front page Hindi banner headline, 
about five, six people, six men who were finally convicted after 35 years. It's the same case. For, uh, for Ajmer. Uh, so obviously there's an instruction that go to Ajmer. Now those five, those six photographs with their names are on the front page. Now, this is a Hindi daily. It's a, it's a, it's a it's Hindi a, daily, and this is the news, editor of a news agency. It's a news been. worth reporting. Mm -hmm. yes, it yes, is absolutely. important that something like this drags for thirty-five years, and yes, those criminals are brought to book after thirty-five years. Is something worth reporting? Uh, but should that be a banner headline with names and photographs mm -hmm. on the front page, just on the day when the whole country is discussing? Something else. Something else. Uh, these are things that these you are need things to... we can worry, we can concern, and uh, one could also argue that they just once a, a television anchor said that if you don't have run out, if you run out of anything, you just do Hindu versus Muslim. That's how I get my ratings. Okay. So it's it could be just that. It could be keep, put some few Muslim names there. You'll get greater interest in the story. Yeah. Dalit rapes do not seem to have any interest. People are not interested. So the same day, something happens in. Uh, Bihar in Uttar Pradesh. Hmm. Uh, these are not news. Not at all. Now, so for on at one level, I do not object to politicization of these issues, hmm. and the reason for that, Sabha, hmm. is something you would understand. I want women's security to be a political issue because until something becomes a political issue, hmm. it gets no traction. No one bothers. No one is interested. So, I, in that sense, I want it to be politicized. I want I the hard thing to be politicized. The outcomes are never. Uttar Pradesh to be politicized, etc. This hanging yeah. people is. At least anything, you know, I, I want environment issue to be politicized. Mm. I want I education want. to be politicized. Uh, all these, you know, unless anything is politicized, it gets zero attention, zero attention. and zero action. Mm. Politicization is not sufficient, but it is necessary to get any attention and the possibility of action on some issue. Uh, so I would not say don't raise the Bengal issue. Mm. It should be raised. What happened absolutely, is absolutely yeah. unacceptable. And if mm. doctors all over the country stand up and are saying, what are you doing? They're absolutely justified in doing so. Mm. I would want similarly the Bihar issue to be raised. Absolutely. Uttar Pradesh issue it's the to same. Be it's just and this one the background of the victim. That happens to condition whether it gets any attention or not. That, that is what is, is the that is the tragedy that's of the that that's what I what is so disturbing. Absolutely. First, the event is so disturbing. There's just so many events, children being raped here, and yeah. anyway. Yeah. So uh, I also have now. Uh, I want to pull out of the sort of more expansive. And I'm asking a very practical, yeah. down to earth question: Is you know Haryana so well? Haryana's and uh, elections are taking place. May I ask you that what do you think could be the likely outcomes and what are the factors that play in Haryana? Because there would be a huge interest in what can we expect out of Haryana. Uh, may I completely sidestep the question, part of it, which is a predictive part. Okay. You know, I've said bus or prediction maker. Please, That's uh... not my, neither my passion nor my interest. Glad you think so. And well, uh, you did it, it so worked. well. Uh, I did it out of compulsion. Honestly, I did not make a forecast of this election because I wanted to, because it was my professional compulsion or my passion. I did it because I think the mainstream media of this country was hoodwinking this nation. Okay. And I felt it's my duty. Hmm. Twelve years ago, in 2012, I had said goodbye to election forecasting. Hmm. I said I don't want to do it. Hmm. I had to do it a couple of times. This was one of those exceptional situations because I really think by dinning it day in and out, I got to Modi, Char So Par. Mm. This was not reporting on election. This was election campaign. Mm -hmm. And I thought it is my duty as a citizen of this mm. country to puncture this because this was a lie. If it was true, I would have said none of my business to make another mm. forecast step to it. I knew this was untrue. And as a citizen, it was my duty to stand on top of my house and cry as hard as I could, shout, mm -hmm. which is what I did. Mm. Thankfully, I'm under no such compulsion for Haryana, Maharashtra. And okay, this. but give us some, uh, the broad thing some that you, you direction. Know, yeah, I mean, the broad look, when BJP got 10 out of 10 seats mm. in 2019, mm. and there was Haryana Assembly election that followed within a few months, mm. as exactly now, BJP secured only 41. Out, out of, of 90, 90 assembly seats. Mm, yes. 
This time when they're down to five, mm. uh, well, you can just do some arithmetic, basically, which is to say BJP, Congress starts as a front runner. Mm. There's absolutely no doubt. Mm. If you look at the kind of uh, uh, people who are lining up to join the Congress, the kind of uh, excitement that you see around, mm. uh, clearly Congress is the front runner mm. in, Ma in Haryana. Uh, as, as somebody said to me on the street, that this time Congress can't be able to win BJP. So I said that Congress can't be able to win BJP. That, that you know, has happened many times. That, as you know, has happened many times. So huh. there are uh, internal issues in the Congress. Mm. Uh, the only card that BJP has mm. is really the caste card. Mm. You know, the Haryana name for that is Pethis Ek. Mm. Now, people won't understand what is Pethis Ek. It's 35 versus 1. Mm. Haryana mythically has 36 communities. Mm -hmm. And this BJP, uh, and so the basic idea is out of those 36, 35 are on one side versus one Jat. Jat. So basically stoking anti-Jat sentiment is BJP's only card. You know, while BJP manages to present itself as nationalist, mm. national unity and so on, in reality, almost everywhere, mm. they play a caste card. Mm. Uh, caste of card of differences. Uh, in UP, it's anti-Yadav. Here, it's anti-Jat. Sometimes it's anti-Muslim. Haryana, Muslims are too few to actually mm. Only play one, on that. Only one area. One huh? area. Haryana mein politics nahi kar sakte mm -hmm. So, it's anti-Jat. Uh, the, the, uh, the challenge for Congress mm is how does it manage to retain a larger coalition which has supported it in the Lok Sabha election, Jats mm. and Dalits. Dalits have traditionally been pro-Congress. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Congress's challenge is A, to retain Dalits, mm. B, to get the BCs. Mm -hmm. uh, what in other places would be called EBCs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the really backward communities, mm. which have very little political representation. Okay. So if Congress manages to retain mm. this coalition, mm. Congress would be through. Uh, that is the that's the only challenge that Congress has, mm. and to somehow contain its internal disputes. The internal disputes is between the Dalit leadership and the. Dominant Congress, uh, they are factions, chart leadership. The, yeah, there are, are so many factions. Uh, there are factions, there are internal differences. Now, about, uh, I guess, uh, thousands of applicants have put in application for uh, Congress tickets. Mm. Uh, I guess it's about 3,000 applications for 90 seats they have. My God, huh? uh, if Congress manages to get 1,500 of these 3,000 to campaign for Congress, Congress is through. And people in Haryana are very vocal. It's course, not yeah. a place where people are quiet about anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a state where, you know. Yeah. So they will all fight with each other over these tickets. Yeah, uh, but that, that's a usual competitive yeah. politics stuff. Uh -huh. It's just that Congress needs to ensure that uh, uh, the faction fight does not cross a certain boundary. Threshold. Yeah, a certain threshold that they have to maintain. And what do they have to offer to uh, communities other than Jat? That's something That's Congress needs to come out with. If come these on. two things work, then Congress has an upper hand. And what about the other parties? There was JJP which is splitting Look, away. JJP are there is, any other third forces there? There, there, is, there is a third force. There are five of them. Hmm. Uh, there is JJP, which was led by Dushan Chautala, who was the former deputy yes. chief minister. I think it's almost decimated mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. uh, they were in power with the BJP. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, acquired a reputation for being very corrupt mm. uh, and uh, the community mm. uh, is completely against them. Okay. So JJP is almost a non-player. Mm. Then you have uh, JJP's uh, parent party, the INLO, uh, INLB, I Indian National which Local. has a coalition with BSP. So BSP. it's an attempt to get a Jat Dalit coalition. Okay. The Jat part of it is not working very well because that's clearly aligned with the Congress this time. Okay. But in some pockets they would. And the BSP, although it's a party on the decline, Nine. has still some small... Absolutely. Yes. So in a few places, a strong candidate from who has a yes, ticket yes. from this who, who doesn't may be get able from to either disturb side. the apple cart. Mm. And then there is Ahmadmi Party, which uh, had an alliance with Congress in the Lok Sabha election, now does they not have an alliance, uh, Do they isn't, have doing, uh, isn't doing as well as they thought they would mm. be able to do. Maybe uh, Arvind being in jail and so on has affected them very much. Mm. Uh, but still on the border of Punjab, 
a few constituencies, they could be a uh, factor. Okay. They yeah. can be a factor. But and they essentially, will, they, it's a two-way. They will fight on their own. There's no of chance course. of an alliance. No, there's, no, there's, no, there's no chance. That, that's they, quite far. Uh, it's a very, very interesting sequence of events because if Congress does well, then you have a then Delhi also. Anyway, we'll get to that later. You'll have it. Yeah, the, the, the sequence to my mind is this, huh. uh, that uh, after the defeat yeah. in Lok Sabha, I call it a defeat because mm. uh, uh, I said that before the elections as well, if BJP is below 303, mm. It's a moral defeat. Hmm. If they are below 272, it's a political hmm. defeat. If they are below 250, it's a personal defeat to the Prime Minister. Yeah. Hmm. Which is what has turned out to I be. I know. And imagine so, if Odisha uh, had not had this. Uh, then then it was, you know, like, yeah. So, so uh, after the defeat, BJP is desperate to come back hmm. for an electoral sign that hmm. no, hmm. this was an exception. Mm. So, BJP would do anything. Mm. And what's happening in Jharkhand is clearly one of those things yes. that they would deploy to win at least two of these three. Hmm. Uh, three, you're meaning Haryana, Jharkhand and Maharashtra? Maharashtra. Uh, because Jammu Kashmir uh, results will not change the national balance. Even though the Congress will do much better. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a plus thing. Th th that's a complicated the basic area. The balance yeah, yes. is not, uh, because of this very uniqueness of the Jammu Kashmir elections, the yes. fact that it's uh, taking place after so long, the fact that it's the first election after 370 yes. abolition. And it's so also it's a, a union territory right that's now. Right. So that's a very, very unique thing. Uh, BJP would BJP would need to win at least two of mm. these three to to correct the impression mm. that their stock is down that they are they're on mm. the way down. Mm. To my mind, the real final test is not Delhi. Mm. Again, Delhi is considered to be unique. Mm. Uh, it's Bihar. Bihar next year mm. is the final test. Mm. If BJP for some reason loses Bihar, and it is possible, even mm. now I'm saying it is notwithstanding the Lok Sabha outcome, notwithstanding BJP, Janata Dal U, uh, NDA massive victory in Bihar mm. in the Lok Sabha election, mm. BJP could lose the Vidhan Sabha election. Should they lose Vidhan Sabha election, mm. that has direct bearing on the central equation of power. Mm. Then BJP would be seen to be a sinking ship, or at least to Mr. Modi's mm. leadership. Mm. Mr. Modi's government would be seen to be a sinking mm. ship. Mm. That's what they are trying desperately to avoid, and that's what the battle of the next one year is. Right. Mr. Yadav, I want to, you have taken a very clearly articulated position on the subject which is controversial right now, which is the Supreme Court recently gave a judgment allowing uh, subcategorization of quotas. And uh, it's been a very interesting process since then because. Uh, you have been probably, you've, you've given out your reasons, you have given data. I have seen those shows when you're showing that Musahars in Bihar are getting nothing. You're talking about the categories within the Dalit community and you've argued this in an article also. However, Bahujan Samaj Party of Mayawati, which was truly a force for good once upon a time for Dalits. I mean, I my family villages in UP and I once saw that if she was probably the most significant chief minister that the state could have had just by the act of a Dalit woman being there you know so she has taken a position there is a young Dalit MP uh, Chandrasekhar Razad he has taken a position and then you have a uh, Dalit uh, professor academic Anand Tel Tumbe has written an article where he has suggested that the quota within quota would eventually be a step towards dismantling caste-based reservation, a goal of the BJP RSS. And then he says it will create divisions and weaken the Dalit movement. So all of this has come just recently. So could I, have you had any rethink on your position or do you fully stand by it? There's no reason to rethink mm -hmm. uh, because uh, to my mind, the the, the the perspective here hmm. should be what will take social justice forward. I am hmm. I am and have been an ardent supporter hmm. of social justice. Hmm. I have been an ardent supporter of uh, caste sensitive affirmative action policies, hmm. including reservations. Hmm. And uh, as someone who has been a supporter of these, hmm. I see absolutely no reason why one should not take this one step forward. Mm. We have reached a point 
where we have to take the politics and policies of social justice one step forward. Mm. There are many components to that mm. and sub quota happens to be one such thing. Mm. Mm. And it's not just the SCST sub quota that I support. I actually also believe that uh, within the OBC at the national level, there is no sub quota. At the there state is, level, um, no, for Bihar has. No, no, state level, they have quota for state government jobs. But for central government jobs, mm. there is no sub quota. And I have been mm. arguing for quite some time mm. that we need a sub quota within mm. that as well, because within the OBC, you have dominant OBC communities, landed OBC communities, which are in a position to benefit from that. And then there are artisanal and service community which get nothing. Uh, similarly, in the case of uh, scheduled caste, there is a very clear difference mm. for which there is ample evidence, census mm. evidence. Mm to show that uh, in terms of educational opportunities, there is a huge gap between some communities hmm. which could take advantage, others who have not been able to take advantage. And the reason is not that these communities of the first category were edging someone out. No, hmm. when, when the doors of uh, reservation were opened, Hmm. Some happened to be standing there. They walked. They were up to. Well, they've not. Uh, they've they not pushed in. anyone out. They've, right. They're not oppressors of the others. It's just a differential access hmm. which has done so. If it was a small difference, you could overlook it. Hmm. But the difference now is so, so big, huge. so huge. Hmm. Just to illustrate it in the case of Punjab, because that's where this particular court case started. started. Punjab in Punjab, and... if you look at two, dom two or three dominant uh, large communities of Dalits, there mm. are the Ravidasis, mm. the leather workers, mm. uh, who have 3.05% graduates amongst them, okay. which is lower than the national average of 6%. Mm -hmm. Now look at, compare them to other communities. Mm. There are Valmikis of mm. Punjab, mm. Hindu Valmikis, mm. they are 1.26%, less than half of them. Okay. And then there are Majbi Sikhs, huh. who are 0.61%. I see. Now, would you not say that this and is And Punjab has a 32% Dalit population. Large Dalit population. The largest. Big right. chunks, mm. with such huge disparities. Mm -hmm. How do you address it? The, only, the one way of addressing it was mm. to say, okay, let's make two slices within that, mm. if it's 30%. Let's say we make 15-15. Mm. In the top 15, you put those mm. half population who have benefited mm. a little more. And in the bottom, you have the other half. Mm. So the, the point to remember about the reason why I support the basic decision of the Supreme Court is mm. A, that it it the order simply says the states can, can do I know it. The order does not say you must you subclassify. Must it no. Yeah. It gives them the power to do so. Mm. It says, however, you should do it on a rational basis, bring evidence and then do this, which is a very sensible thing. And then you do. should have a caste census. And then you would need a caste census for yeah, these things. You already have some information. Yeah. Uh, so I find that to be a, a, a step which takes social justice policies one step forward. Right. I can understand why some people oppose it because uh, uh, in the case of at least some political leaders, uh, unfortunately, it's directly linked to, to their, their vote, uh, the vote base. Uh, the vote base. Unfortunately, so then, unfo most they are, they are of the political saying, leaders. Therefore, Mayavati is a jat of uh, Dalit. Uh, that makes me sad because uh, Mayavati has been a Dalit icon, not just a jat of icon. But when on such a critical issue, she comes out def what appears to people to be defending the interest of one subsection within Dalits. What about That's Anand? Not, no, Anand's case is completely different. It mm. would be completely wrong. It's to his think academic of, uh, conclusion. Uh, no, but but I think people don't read the entire article. In fact, what what Anand is saying, mm. I read the article carefully because I take Anand Neltumbe very seriously. He's a reflective person. Mm. He's not to, to to say someone like him is reflecting the interest of an upper crust of the list. That's what I. That, wrong. That's, no, no, no. We, that's even I know he would not so be you've doing that. Up, you've picked up. Uh, you 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 use one sentence mm. where he say that's where he begins. Mm. By the end of the article, his conclusions are mm. actually, he says, yes, there is a deep and serious difference within Dalits. Mm. Yes, it needs to be addressed now. Mm. And yes, the way of doing it, instead of subclassification of jatis, mm. you should actually identify every family. And families should be subdivided based on their access to education and jobs. Now, I don't know whether the formula would be accepted by others. Mm. So, mm. Uh, Anand is not closing his eyes right. to the real and serious issues. Mm. And that's my only thing. Anyone who says, yes, it's an issue, 
Yes, we should address it. Mm. Here is my formula. I'm willing to speak to mm. that person. Subclassification is one way of mm. doing it. Mm. Another, there can be another way. We can talk about it. But uh, I do. Having said that, mm. uh, allow me to just mention one more thing. Mm. There's one aspect of Supreme Court judgment which has which I have opposed from the beginning. The creamy layer which observation. Is the creamy layer. I but do that's not, not in the judge. That's an opinion that's of the, the judges. But the trouble is, if four judges out of seven yeah. give an opinion, then high courts all over the country will cite that opinion, and it will become a de facto law. Okay. So, I think it's time that somebody went to the Supreme Court okay. and asked a clarification to say, me Lord, is right. that your order or is that not your order? order? Right. So that it then becomes clear. It does not become a legal precedent. That's so then, what I'm worried about. It should not become in, and, and honestly, this is not the stage to talk about creamy, creamy layer absolutely within, the, I agree uh, within Dalits. I mean, the OBCs, there has been a creamy layer. There has been a mechanism to address mm. it. The definition should be changed because mm. the definition is very is, is uh, too low. Mm. It should be a better definition. But I do not oppose the very idea of creamy layer mm. within OBC. In the case of SC, however, mm. it's a very different matter. In the case so of somebody should go then go to the Supreme Court. Yes, you have to, you, to to get this clarified. And if the should the Supreme Court not say this, in that case uh, the Parliament should step in and clarify yes. that creamy layer does not apply to Dalits. Okay. That is a clarification that is a must. Having said it, I think, look, we are, uh, for me, the larger issue, it's not just the sub quota happens to be a thing which has become an issue right mm. now. Uh, but I think we should be looking at the future of social justice politics. Mm. Future of social justice politics will have addressing micro communities within each. Uh, there are uh, mm. uh, the EBCs mm. uh, within OBC. There mm. are Mahadalits. There are Pasmanda Muslim. Mm. Yes. Within Muslim, the Pasmanda issue has to take a national center stage. Mm -hmm. And then there are DNTs. Mm -hmm. The issue of the denotified tribes. Yes, of this is, they is are a... the real Mahadalits of Mahadalits of this country. Yes, absolutely. No I recognition. Agree. So social justice politics will, on the one hand, have to move towards accepting uh, disadvantages within disadvantages. Mm. Number two, it has to increase the pie. Mm. Right now, reservations are becoming smaller and smaller. And the, the jobs contest are for coming those down. The public jobs, sector jobs, jobs are, are coming down. So, so you have to address number one, the, the issue government of public sector is jobs. committed to outsourcing anything possible, it, it, you know. Uh, it, it began with the previous government mm. and it has been practiced by non-BJP governments at the state level as well. As well, absolutely. So it's a serious yeah. systemic issue yes, that we are absolutely. dealing with. And that also relates to the question of private sector. Mm. Why is it that affirmative action should not apply to private sector? You need not turn it into reservation. Mm. Use other instruments. There are multiple instruments available to state. But the BJP but has suggested it might do it in this budget, no? Well, I they have they've sort of I given would, some. Uh... I would welcome any government mm. uh, which takes steps towards extending the ambit of affirmative action mm. beyond the public sector. Mm -hmm. And then there is this artificial constitutional cap mm. at 50 percent. Mm. which the Supreme Court is willing to relax for e B e EWS, mm. but not for anyone else. I know. So that has to be removed. So I'm thinking of a long-term future. And if I oh, look so at it from that long-term future point, mm. sub-quota within SC mm. is a legitimate demand. Mm. It is necessary, though for me that is not the centerpiece of my future. The centerpiece has centerpiece? to be expensive. Because I've taken up so much of it. What, what is the centerpiece of your future and how are you May I ask you that how do you function, Mr. Yadav? How did you, you were traveling in the field? How is do you repeat that exercise? You are writing, you are giving interviews, you are sharing your time with me. And then so that's what I'm saying. You you're both giving illuminating insights into policies, into society, and then you're also going into the field. So how are you functioning? I mean, how did you decipher things, uh, the election, uh, the, the trend in 2024? Uh, uh, two different things. The first is the bigger question of what is the centerpiece. Hmm. To me, the center, sociologically, okay. the centerpiece is bottom of the pyramid. Indian society is a pyramid. Hmm. The top of the pyramid has been captured by the BJP, hmm. which is in terms of caste, class and gender. Yeah. BJP has walked away with the top of the pyramid. Including private, uh, big yeah. monopolies, corporate so, monopolies. So in every it's a sense shocking they, display yeah, so of... The uh, bottom of the pyramid mm -hmm. is, is, the, is the stout, is the, is the biggest social force to defend constitution, republic and democracy in this country. Mm -hmm. 
So future politics has to be politics of the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. uh, BJP's political strategy has been to capture the top of the pyramid and walk away with a few slices from the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mahadalit. EBC, yeah. somewhere this, this, somewhere this, Valmiki, Valmiki, somewhere etc. that. that. Uh, the, 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 the challenge for the opposition or challenge for anyone who wants to defend democracy and republic in this country is to consolidate bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. now, while from the top of the pyramid, there would be ideological dissenters who should always be welcomed. Well, yeah. There were whites who opposed apartheid. Mm. So yes, we have to, and they should be welcomed. Mm. But sociologically, Mm -hmm. Which is the social force that would defend this republic? That's my real concern. So we've seen a transformation of Rahul Gandhi. You agree with that, right? Yeah, and this is I a mean, welcome transformation. It's welcome. a complete transformation because earlier, you know, the, the many of the so-called Baba Log which were around him, they're all sitting in the BJP now. If yeah. you look at it, uh, and they're personally, all the... the transformation may not be as big as it appears because I knew Rahul Gandhi 15 years ago and I know him now for the last okay. two years. Uh, he has remained a very sincere person. Uh, connected and you know people who are aware of the fact that they have privileges and okay. that they need to hmm. they need to uh, they're sensitive about the fact that you know I happen to enjoy you and I also belong to that category yeah, absolutely. people who happen to enjoy yes. privileges but do not use those privilege to accentuate our personal privileges mm -hmm. but actually use those privileges to do something which is just and decent in this country and society. Mm -hmm. Rahul in that sense belongs to those people yeah. who okay. is aware of those. There has been a transformation. Yeah, the transformation is he because seems to have understood. he's traveled, he's walked, he's met people, yeah. he's uh, hugged them yeah. out of the SPG cordon. He's <laughs> taken yeah. his life beyond that cordon. Yeah. Uh, earlier he would do it in fits and starts, mm. but the Bharat Joro Yatra was a transformative moment. This is not just my assessment, yeah. that's something he himself says. There's also a change in the positions of the Congress that's, on caste. Yeah. I mean, they missed the whole Mandal moment. Twice. It happened because of this. Remember, yeah. the first big caste uh, upsurge in this country was late 60s, mm. which not only did the Congress miss, it was actually in opposition to the Congress yeah. that it came. Right. Mandal hmm. bypassed Congress. Absolutely. And it's the third moment where, and for the first moment where Congress is in the driver's seat, mm -hmm. uh, it's trying to be so. Mm. So uh, I think there's absolutely no doubt so that, we are the, a... that on the caste question, mm. Congress's position is principally driven by Rahul Gandhi personally. personally. I don't Absolutely. think Congress par as a party was so much prepared Not at all, for yeah. this. He has personally with determination and uh, resolve yes. taken the party in that direction, which is welcome because uh, this actually connects to the politics of the bottom of the pyramid. Absolutely. So in a yes. sense, he's taking Congress back to hmm. its own social base yes. uh, and a social base that can defend. For me, the real interest is not so much in a political party hmm. being connecting to its improving, expanding its vote bank. My larger question was, what is that uh, because in order, if you the larger issue is how do we defend this republic? Yes, which so you think close to being so shut Congress down. Congress can be a vehicle to defend the republic. You need a political the... vehicle. Hmm. You need ideological positions. Hmm. You need a social base. Hmm. Uh, at the moment, I would say India coalition hmm. in general and Congress in particular hmm. is a political vehicle. The bottom of the pyramid is the social base, hmm. and Swadharma of Bharat hmm. is the ideology which can defend this republic. Thank you so much, Mr. Yadav. That was a fascinating Delighted. conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.